Father, I thank you for the coming forth of your word. Thank you because as you teach us always, we are edified and thank you for the readiness of the hearts of them that are listening to me now, them that are here and them that are following from their homes, on the road, at their workplaces, wherever they are, but most so those, Lord, that have taken the time to be here. Thank you, Jesus. And I know that this word penetrates the depths of their minds, that as they hear, Lord, they are brought to an understanding that you are God and that you are good. And that, Lord, you are not just God to them, but you are their king, you are their joy, you are their supply, you are their uh, victory. And once they have you, Lord, they are settled. And so I pray that even as the Holy Spirit in them communicates these truths, these truths are not taken away from them by any form of lies, no matter what it may be. Because, Lord, you are the Lord of truth. So I thank you. And this I've prayed, believing and trusting in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Uh, Pastor Jaffred, good to see you. It's always an honor to have you. Thank you that every time you come around Eldoret, you know here. Amen. Uh, it's always an honor. We continue to ask ourselves and as well answer this question of whether the Holy Spirit can live a believer. So the question we are answering, this is the third session, is does the Holy Spirit live a believer? Does the Holy Spirit live the believer? In the book of Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6 where we ended last Tuesday, Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6, scripture said that he that began the good work in you is faithful. And indeed because of his faithfulness, he is the one that will complete it until the day of Christ. So, what we have is that the completion of the work is not our duty. Praise God. The completion of the work is not the duty of the believer. It is the duty of Jesus Christ himself. So, we are confident of this very thing. When we were praying, we were led in First John chapter chapter 5, that you know, there is a confidence that we have from verse 14. That there is a confidence that we have. That if we ask of anything according to his will, he hears us. Then he continues to say, and if he hears us, there is a knowledge that we have. That whatever we have asked of him, indeed answers have been provided. So that is a confidence. And now the other confidence that we have is the kind that says, Philippians 1.6, that he that began the good work in us. So when he began a work, he did not begin a substandard work. Friends, you are not a substandard work. It is men that do substandard work, not God. So anyone that is a believer is a perfect work. Look at yourself and say, I am a perfect work of God. Now these are not things that you must wait for man of God to tell you. Because Christ has spoken these things to the church, which church is you and I. The church is you and myself. So there is a confidence that the believer has. That confidence is that there is a work in you which was begun. But then we remember something that Jesus said that it is 
finished. So it means the work fundamentally by principle, even in the spirit, the work is complete. So he's not adding anything on you. So when Peter says you are being built up a spiritual house, it means the concept of the house is already complete and then the building comes to stand. That is why now your character is transformed from the very person of who you are. Praise the Lord. When the engineer is on site building, they are not trying to concoct, concoct some other things. No, they are looking at the plan. The plan is complete. So you are complete. That is what he says in Colossians chapter 2. That you are complete in him. Who is the head? So the believer was made complete. You are not trying to make yourself complete in any way. So we say it. That the faithfulness of the Holy Spirit is demonstrated in completion all in the transforming of the believer into the very image of who the believer is in the Spirit. And we say that the Spirit of God is the seal of the salvation that you received. If you have a bottle of water and you mistakenly take away the lid, anything can happen to that water and you may not have it anymore. But for as long as it remains sealed and the integrity of the bottle is not tampered with, that water is safe. So, the Holy Spirit is the seal of the salvation that you received. It means, for as long as salvation endures, the believer cannot lose the Holy Spirit. But we know that you cannot lose salvation. Amen, I'm Nagani. We know that the believer cannot lose salvation. It means the reason why you cannot lose salvation is because the seal is intact. Glory to the Lord. The reason why you cannot lose salvation is because the seal is intact. And so as I was ending, I said that the Holy Spirit will not undo his work of regeneration. So that today he has regenerated you, then tomorrow he degenerates you. No, he doesn't do that. It is the work of the enemy to degenerate man. But the Holy Spirit regenerates you. That is what he says in Titus chapter 3. That you were washed with the washing of regeneration. Maybe I should just read that for you. Chap Titus chapter 3. Uh, we start from verse 4. Titus chapter 3. And we read verse 4. He says, but when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared. Titus chapter 3 and verse 4. But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done. I have told people, let me just take another minute and explain this again and hopefully this time it will sink in. Verse 5 says, not by works of righteousness which we have done. Meaning, man has already done those things. Yet, even when man has done those things, God is not basing on those things that man has done to do what he has done or to do what he will do for those that think that he will do. God is not basing on man's conduct to respond and do what he does. So he says, not according to works of righteousness which we have done. So there are many people that say, you know pastor, me I thank God. I desired this thing and I prayed to God. Then I told God, I am going to do this and this and this. And I am doing this so that Lord you might do this for me then somehow good things happen to that man or woman. Then they say, you remember the other thing that I did? God must have looked at that. God must have looked at that. No. Was what you did good? Yes, it was good. In any case, you might find many people were blessed by what you did. 
But is it what God based on to do what he has done to you? No. God has not based on anything that man has done. So when the kindness and the love of God, our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. How? By Through the washing of regeneration. The kind that gives you a new identity. To be a new generation, the one that the Apostle Peter tells us in chapter 2, 1 Peter, that you are a chosen generation, it is that you have a new identity. When you became born again, you were given a new identity. And because of that identity, now your purpose has been defined. Bwana Yesu asifiwe. Amen. So, the Holy Spirit will not undo his work of saying that you, Martin, you have been regenerated. Forever it is written and sealed, Yakwamba, you have been regenerated. In the same way, the Holy Spirit will not give up on his transformative work. Praise the Lord. Jesus has told us that he will lead us into all truth. Into all truth. Yet again, it is the same Jesus that declared that he himself is the truth. So it is the Holy Spirit that leads us into Christ. He will not give up his duty because he has a specific agenda given to him by the Son that you, the Holy Spirit, your duty is to lead all men into me. He cannot give up on that because the Holy Spirit is obedient. We saw that when we are starting to see the person of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So he will not give up on his transformative work. How does he transform us? We are told that our minds are renewed even in the word. But who teaches us the word? The Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit carries from of the Son because the Son carries from of the Father and then all of it is deposited into you. Every time you are studying the word and you pray, Holy Spirit, I desire to understand this. And then you understand it. Holy Spirit, I desire to understand this. And then you understand it by the Spirit of God. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. And that is why I've told us that it does not matter how many non-believers know so they think. This Bible from Genesis to Revelation, they cannot explain to you in truth. Because it is the Holy Spirit that leads people into all the truth. Yet Jesus said that the world cannot receive this spirit. The world does not know the spirit of God. So the world cannot know the spirit. So it means they are not able to comprehend scripture. That is why we thank God for the Ethiopian eunuch. As much as he was reading so loud that Philip heard from afar, when Philip asked, the Ethiopian eunuch was genuine enough to say, how can I understand unless these things have been explained to me? So it means minus explanation, there is no understanding. So you've done well to be here that these things may be explained. Amen? And it is the Holy Spirit that empowers men to explain. Same way the Holy Spirit empowered men to write. Are we together, saints? So I said that the Holy Spirit will not redefine eternal life to mean temporary life. Because the Holy Spirit leads you into all truth. Yet, Jesus has said, as much as he's the truth, indeed he's the life. And the life that he gives, you know, when, Jesus, when God gave the Son, he gave that whoever believes might have everlasting, not temporally. Everlasting or eternal, not temporally. So the Holy Spirit is restricted to only communicating everlasting life. If he stops communicating everlasting life, then he has not been faithful. Yet we have seen in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 9 that God is faithful. So the Holy Spirit is faithful. Amen. And then I told us to write this statement because I told us we'll start from it today. And I said that man can only lose what they found. Man can only lose what they found. 
But see this. You did not find the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit found you. So in any case, you cannot lose him because you never found him. He instead found you. So uh, the only thing, <laughs> but the Holy Spirit is God. So it means God cannot lose you. In, a, in, a, in any case, he has said, I will lose none. That is Jesus. Yet the Holy Spirit only is restricted to the communication of what Jesus has spoken. But Jesus has said, whoever has been given to him, he will lose none. We are establishing the fact that man should not fear saying that not man, just mere man, but the believer should not fear whether they have the Holy Spirit today or not. Because as a matter of fact, you have the Holy Spirit and you can, let me, for purposes of understanding, let me say you cannot lose him. But the reason you cannot lose him is because you did not find him. He found you. So in Galatians chapter 4, when Paul is asking the Galatian church why they are going back to beggarly elements, put up for me verse 9, Galatians chapter 4, verse 9. Why they are going back to beggarly elements. He tells them, now that you have known the Lord, or rather, then he corrects it, he makes it even more specific, or rather you are known of God. Galatians chapter 4 and verse 9. He says, but now after you have known God, right now you have known God, then he says, or rather, sweeter again, unknown by God. So man knowing God is because God has known them. No man can know God unless they acknowledge they are known by God. Same way no man can love God unless they know God loves them. So before you tell God how much you love him, first be persuaded that you love, that, that you know he loves you. Why? Because the apostle John, the apostle of love has told us that we love him. Why? Because he first loved us. So the condition for you to be able to love God is because you know that he loved you first. So no matter how much you say, you know, I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. Do you know that he loves you? If you're saying that because you want to entice him to love you, that is not how it works with our God. So I said you cannot lose uh, the Holy Spirit because you did not find him. It is the Holy Spirit that found you. Tell me a dead body that walks around looking for people to tell them, don't you see I am dead? Don't you see I am dead? And yet Paul tells us that you were dead in your trespasses. Meaning you had to be discovered in your dead state. That is what the Holy Spirit did. Discovered you in your dead state. You did not discover him. Amen. So you cannot lose him because you did not find him in the first place. He's the one who found you. Glory to the Lord. Hallelujah. Now there are some other people who say, that you know, you will lose the gifts and the salvation that the Holy Spirit brings. Let me not spend a lot of time on that because I've talked about it. We know that the gifts of God are without repentance. And we know that salvation, actually when we finish here today, next week we are going to look at eternal security and then afterwards we shall speak of this thing of can people Forfeit salvation. We want men to be sure of being eternally saved that they will not be lied to by men. Yakwamba, today you're not born again again. You need to be born again again because something has happened. Hapo katikati. No. Otherwise, God would have a very dirty book in which He records and then anavuta. Kishafanya makosa, anavuta. Then ukijifanya mzuri, tena anaandika. Our God doesn't function like that. So let men not think that God is man. Yet he is. But he's not the kind of man that man is. So there are some others that say, you know, you're going to lose this and you lose your salvation. But we have seen in Ephesians chapter 1, we can go back there, Ephesians chapter 1. And uh, let's 
Let me read verse 13 alone. We have seen quite uh, many, but let's see verse 13 today. It says, In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Let me repeat. In him also you trusted after that you heard the word of truth which is the gospel of your salvation. So you trust because you have heard. So allow yourself to listen to the word more and more. Hear the word more and more. Amen. So you heard the gospel of your salvation. Now when you believe, this is what happened to anyone that believed. How many people of us here have believed? You see? Now scripture says, when you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. A seal is to the effect that there might be no leakages, no contamination. Now, it is important that you understand where you were sealed. The believer has been sealed in the person of the spiritual man that they are. When we say you cannot be contaminated, we are speaking of the spiritual man that you are. The devil cannot do anything concerning your spiritual person. Yet the devil can play with your mind. So I have said here, and I'll say it again, that what men call spiritual warfare is actually triggered by the battle of the mind. Why? Because the devil is also fighting to have a piece of your mind. In Genesis chapter 3, you remember from long ago when we started this series, it has been building. When we started, we we saw the blunder that Eve made. So in Genesis, in Genesis chapter 3, the devil comes, the, the serpent comes and is asking, did God really say? Because in verse 1, chapter 3, Genesis, scripture says the serpent was more cunning than every beast of the earth that had been made. So came to Eve and said, did God really say? That is feeding a mind negatively all in reverse so that Eve can start to doubt. And I have said the reason why it was easy for Eve to doubt is because when God was speaking, he spoke to Adam. So it was easy for Eve to doubt because what he had, he didn't hear it from God. He had it from a third, a, a, another party. So it's important that even when your pastor is preaching or when anyone is speaking, desire to hear what God is speaking even when he's speaking it through man. Because if you take it just as the word of Pastor Nicholas, the word of Pastor Nicholas might fade away, but the word of God will remain. So as I speak here, God speaking, not man. When man has spoken and they have said, God, and you're not persuaded that it is God saying, you will see the blunders that Eve made as she was even reporting what God said. At that very time, she had forgotten exactly what God said. So always be watchful. So you were sealed with the Holy Spirit. Then if something is sealed, there can be no escape. Let me give you an example of a vacuum, a vacuum seal. Nothing can escape. You can't find air in there if all air has been pushed out. No air can come in because it is airtight. That is how you have been sealed. Now the question can be, if you've been sealed and then they say that you can, you can lose something because it is you that has been sealed in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 3 scripture says for you died and your life now is hidden with Christ where in God hidden with Christ in God so there is a hiding that has happened to the believer one because he has died the question then that I want us to ask ourselves Take this from uh, Ephesians 1.13 and Colossians 3.3 3, and then we ask ourselves this question. The question is, can a believer therefore truly break the seal that is placed on him by God?
can a believer therefore truly break the seal that is placed on him by God? Because for man to lose something, he must break the seal of the Holy Spirit. But then if man is able to break that seal, then it means man is stronger than God. Jesus has said that it is only a stronger man that can come and plunder the goods of the inhabitant. When he was speaking about Christ Jesus, plundering the goods of the enemy because the enemy had taken man as a commodity. Then God, the stronger one, came and took possession of man. So now you are free. So, so if man is able to break that seal and lose something, then it means man is stronger. Yet we know that God is strong. When we speak of the strength of God, don't bring the strength of the strongest men on earth. Are we together, saints? So from this we understand that indeed the Holy Spirit is the mark of a true believer. When you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of truth. How many of us are believers? All of you have the Holy Spirit. So there is no service that we shall make for the infilling of the Holy Spirit. If there is any service like that, then it's a service for men to receive Christ. Believers do not receive another opposite day, another different day to receive the Holy Spirit. Maybe many of them do not understand, like what we see in Acts chapter 19, when Paul met former disciples of John. It is just because they had not been taught. When you are taught right, it comes up. That is why you say, wow, okay. Yeah, it has always been there. It is just that your eyes were close to it. That is why. Paul having said what he said in Ephesians 1.13, down in verse 18 he says, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. The challenge that man has is eyes are not enlightened. To see these things and to walk in them. So I have said that the Holy Spirit is the mark of a true believer. So to lose he that is the mark of a true believer would be to lose salvation. But it is impossible to lose salvation. It is impossible. Anyway, in two weeks time I will explain this. Why it is impossible to lose salvation. But then, and this I have taught about it in 2020. Three things. Quenching the Holy Spirit. Grieving the Holy Spirit. And blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Let me handle two. Jujutu. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse and verse 30. Let's start from verse 29 so we understand it well. Okay. Verse, verse, verse 30. Let me read verse 30 first. It says and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Verse that, verse that people in, in, in the control room to Nataka verse that Ephesians 4.30 says, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Now, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 19. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 19. 1 Thessalonians 5.19. He says, do not quench the spirit. The question that we have from Ephesians 4.30 and 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 19, we've already said the Holy Spirit is here to stay. But then what do these passages imply? Because someone might tell you that you know once you've quenched the Holy Spirit and then they'll tell you, you know, and, and you know you've grieved the Holy Spirit. Because men, when they are grieved, they walk away. 
They think even the Holy Spirit, when he's grieved, he's walking away. So they want to fit God in their ideas. Have you seen those memes when there is a very small box and then they make an illustration of a very fat man and then they write on that man God and then on the box they write man's imagination and ideas. And then you see a, another person trying to push that man to fit into that box. That is when men are trying to fit God into their imaginations. Never do that. It is not you to fit God into your imaginations because it is God that called you into his fellowship. He's the one that sets the standard. Amen? So, what do these statements imply? Do they mean that now the Holy Spirit has left us? Let's start with the first one in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30. But let's start it from verse 29. Ephesians 4, now verse 29. So we see what it is that... Uh, If you understand this well, from verse 17 of Ephesians chapter 4, just remain there. From verse 17, he starts by saying, do not walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened. Then he says, you have to put off the old man because it is not your nature anymore because of who you have received. Praise the Lord. Now in verse 29 he says let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. But what is good for necessary edification, what does it do? That it may impart grace to the hearers. So you let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification that it may impart grace to the hearers. You let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. So it means they are, there is a tendency for a believer to still speak recklessly. Do you know that as a believer, there is a language that the believer has, because you are a holy nation. Every nation has a national language. Isn't it so? Every nation has a national language. Now the, nas the nation of God also has a national language. The nation, the language called Christ. So he's saying, do not let any corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. But what is good for necessary edification that it may impart grace to the hearers. Then verse 30. And, do not just read that as English. That word and is the Greek word kai, K-A-I, which means indeed, which means also, which means even. So, verse 30 is a continuing explanation of verse 29. So, let me read it for you this with the understanding of the meaning of the word and in this case. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, verse 30, 29. But what is good for necessary edification that it may impart grace to the hearers? Next verse. Indeed, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. So the speech of man, when it deviates from the testimony of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is like, for all the time I have taught this man, this man has not understood it. For all the time I have taught this young lady, this young lady has not understood it. And that is the grief of the Holy Spirit. In the sense that, Nikama hamjaelewana. So he says, Indeed do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So he's saying, it is the Holy Spirit of God it is by him that you have been sealed. And yet in your speech, you're speaking like you have been consumed. You're speaking like there is no future for you. Yet the Holy Spirit in you is saying, I have, it is by me that you have been sealed. And then the Holy Spirit is like, I wish you would understand. I wish you would understand. I wish you would understand. Amen. 
Now, verse 19, 1 Thessalonians 5. 1 Thessalonians 5, 19. He has said, do not quench the spirit. Let us go back to verse 16. So we start from there. From verse 16. He says, Rejoice always. This is an instruction. Are we together? Rejoice always. 17. Pray without ceasing. Another instruction. 18. In everything, Give thanks. In how many things? Give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for who? That is now when he says, do not quench the spirit. Because it is the spirit that reveals to you the will of the Father. So when you are not rejoicing always, when you are not praying without ceasing, when you are not giving thanks to God in everything, not for everything, there is a difference. So that you will not come here, kupeana ushuda na utuambie, bwana esu asifiwe wapendwa, na shukuru mungu nimekuwa mgonjwa wiki mzima. So we are not giving thanks for everything, rather we are giving thanks in everything. So it means, those things are not the inspiration of us giving thanks. So you cannot say, I have no reason to give thanks. No, you are not told to have a reason to give thanks. You are told to have to give thanks even when in, in not having a reason, you give thanks. Amen? In everything, even in not having a reason, still you give thanks. That is the will of the Father for you. So the quenching of the Holy Spirit is, the Holy Spirit is burning with prayer. The Holy Spirit is burning with rejoicing always. The Holy Spirit is burning with giving thanks in everything. And yet for you, you are saying, oh, that is you quenching the Holy Spirit. So these do not mean that actually the Holy Spirit has left you. But the reality of the matter, if you remember where we started from, the Holy Spirit, we can say that he is sorrowful because of man's conduct that is not in line with his nature. Because of man's conduct that is not in line with your nature. But it is not that the Holy Spirit has left you. So believer, you have to be keen. The Holy Spirit in you. I, I said when we were starting, much as he's not emotional, if he can sympathize with your weaknesses, then it means in him, he's a person who will watch when you're trying to le make less significant the testimony of God in you. So always, always, and I will repeat always in verse 29, he has said, let no corrupt word. In verse 16, he has said, rejoice always. 17, pray without ceasing. 18, in everything give thanks. Very important. Then he tells you, do not quench. Do not quench. There are, there, let me just add for you this verse in verse 20. Eh? Where he says, do not despise prophecies. He's not speaking about the prophecies that men stand and they tell you, Martin, when you were coming from your house, you left your shoes on your bed. Isn't it? And then, someone from somewhere shouts, God deep, a man of God. That is not the prophecy he's speaking about. He is not speaking about the prophecy of me telling you that you were born ten children in your family. I am telling you there are many people that do not know God and they can tell you what you ate for lunch, what you had for breakfast. They can even tell you what is going to happen to you tomorrow. 
and they will be exact. But we know that what is of God cannot be shared by any man. So when we speak of prophecies, I've talked about this so-called five-fold ministry, and I've explained a prophet as being different from a fortune teller or a forward teller. A prophet is an explainer of the mysteries of God. The one who will tell you. So when he tells you do not quench the spirit, then in verse 20 he tells you do not despise prophecies. The reason why you will quench the spirit is because when situations come in verse 18, they bring you down. You become sorrowful. And so you see, I have no reason to give thanks to God. But the prophecy has said, for in him is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Then you, and, and, and then you're saying, no, I don't think so. And then you beat yourself down because of your shortcomings. Yet the prophecy has said that for he made him who knew no sin to become sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And you're despising it, that is why you're not able to give thanks to God. Always. Always allow yourself to live even according to the life of God that has been spoken to you even by the word. Are we together saints? So, when man does not live according to the standard of what he has been given, even by the spirit of God in him, man hinders their own relationship. It is not that God then is hindered, eh? but man hinders their own relationship. With the Holy Spirit. Man hinders their own relationship. With the Holy Spirit. But this does not nullify your salvation. That is why it is possible that man is struggling here on earth. The believer. They are suffering in every way. And yet. They are justified. But when man learns to relate with the Holy Spirit perfectly. There will be no struggle. Glory to the Lord. Amen. But what causes man to have that fluctuation, that uncertainty, that state of not being sure of exactly whether they are born again or not, whether they have the Holy Spirit or not. And then even us, we sometimes get confused. We are like, tukiangalia mtu tunajuliza, kwani hui mtu akuaje? Ni kama roa ametoka kwa ake, hana roa mtakatifu tena. What causes that confusion? Because yes, you can look at some people and you'll be like, you know, there's a saying that we have back in, 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 my, in, my, in, in my language where we say, you know, these people that do juju, they have those back clothes. How many of us know of back clothes? I don't know if you have them here. There's a tree from where they get a back and then they beat it down and then they make a cloth out of it. It's used in many local gatherings back there. And so, in some way, to the traditionalists, it is, a, it is the representation of the presence of their gods. So there is this, this saying that says, ah, they are just keeping those clothes, but the gods have already escaped. So sometimes you can look at someone and you be like, who you mutu and I'll be true. And I am but who and I could ya to canisani like ni hatudani kama bado akona rom takatif. Where does the confusion come from? The confusion comes because man, including you and me, cannot know whether someone has truly been born of the Spirit or whether he is just what Jesus spoke of as shallow ground and infertile ground. Of course, he told us in some way that by their fruits you shall know them. But man cannot, because you cannot check, are you able to check my heart? Even when you check my heart, if you are a surgeon, you will only see muscles. You will not see the testimony of the Spirit of God. So you are not able to. I want to give us homework. I, I think these days I give you homework every day. Every time I step here. 
which is good. Let's go back and study from uh, Luke 8, from verse 1 to 15, for your sake. Eh? For your sake, from verse 1 to 15. But in a nutshell, there is something that he says there, and he's speaking of what is commonly called as the parable of the sower. From verse 4 he says, Great multitude had gathered and they had come to him from every city. And then he spoke by a parable. The sower came out to sow his seed. And as he sowed, some fell by the wayside and it was trampled on. And the birds of the air divided, some fell on rock. And as soon as it sprang up, it withered because it lacked moisture. And some fell among thorns. And the thorns sprang up and it choked it. But others fell on good ground, sprang up and yielded crop. A, hand, a hundredfold. And when he had said these things, he cried, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. That is verse 8. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. I have spoken about this still in this very series. That there are some people that seem excited to follow Jesus. Seem excited to follow Jesus because it's interesting. Maybe because they have seen another friend of theirs saying, I receive Christ. They are like, oh, I will also receive Christ. Oh, there is a beautiful girl at that church. Okay, I'm also going there. Nimekubali. Nimempokea ebwana. Lakini, dani mwake ye mwenye wame anajua haja muamini yesu. But because they have spoken, and that is why when we speak of confession, we are not talk, saying this ya kuongea. That is why people that are not people that are physically not able to speak can be able to confess Jesus Christ. Hata bila kutoa sauti. So there are some people that seem excited to follow Jesus. And there are some others that may exhibit what appears to be supernatural gifts. I have told you, even non-believers do those things. Amen. And that is why sometimes when the miraculous happens, there are some people who don't believe and they say that must be the devil because they know even the enemy is able to do those things. So they are not the distinguishing features. So there are some that get excited to follow. Sometimes they exhibit what appears to be supernatural gifts but yet they were not truly born again. So Jesus gave this as a warning in Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. This is the warning that Jesus gave so that we may not be carried about. Matthew chapter 7. And in verse 21, he says, Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of so not everyone who says Lord, Lord is a believer but he who does the will of my father in heaven. What is the will of the father? That there is a genuine believing. So he says verse 22. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord have we not prophesied in your name? Cast out demons in your name? And done many wonders in your name? Hear what he says. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Hey, people who kept performing miraculous. Okay. So it means, beloved, if you know in your heart you have believed the Lord, that is enough. Are we together? Are we together? So in the same way, there are people that profess to have the Holy Spirit. Yet eventually, by their conduct, they will prove that they never did have the Holy Spirit. And how do they do that? They later, in quotes, turn away from following him. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 14, Romans 8, 14, we are told that as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Romans 8, 14. As many 
as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. So that leading is not yeye kusimama mbele yako alafu aanze kutembea wewe umfuate. No. The kind that your heart is triggered by him at all times that you are a believer in him. So I've said there are people who profess to have the Holy Spirit yet eventually by their conduct they prove that they never did when they later in quotes do the things that man now interprets as turning away. Let me tell you something. In actual sense those people did not lose the Holy Spirit. The fact of the matter is they didn't have the Holy Spirit in the first place. Because from the three weeks that we have had, we have established that once you have the Holy Spirit, He is there to stay. So if anyone appears like they have lost the Holy Spirit, the first question should be, did that person have the Holy Spirit in the first place? Because the one who has the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is there to stay. Yes, there must be a quenching. Yes, there must be a grieving. Yes, there might be a, a, a looking of this man is not yielding in the Spirit of God because they have not been taught, because they have not given themselves, because they have not continued in teaching, because they are not praying continuously, because they are not rejoicing always, because they are not giving thanks in all days, because they are letting corrupt word come up through their mouth. And so the testimony of the Holy Spirit imefinyiliwa, lakini if someone is to the level of uh, the so-called turning away, the question should be, did this person have the Holy Spirit? So let me end with this verse in 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. And I'll read. Uh, this was the Apostle John as was speaking about them that left them at the time when they needed them for the gospel. 1 John chapter 2. And verse 9. Let's start, let me start from verse 18. 18. 1 John 2 18. He says, Little children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they have for if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. Let me repeat verse 19. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, John is saying, the reason why someone will leave, fall away, turn away is because they were not in the first place there. So he says, they, if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be manifest that none of them were of us. So in actual sense, when someone appears like they have lost the Holy Spirit, in actual sense, they have not lost the Holy Spirit. They never had him at all in the first place. That is why in Acts 19, those people appeared as though they were believers. But when Paul asked, they didn't understand. So they had to be taught. So it's important. It's important. But the assurance is, you cannot lose the Holy Spirit. Let's be on our feet and we bless the Lord. Father, we thank you because we cannot run away from you. You hold us so dearly. You have kept us in you and nothing can ever take us away from you. I give you praise, Lord. I give you glory, Lord, because you are good. And for as much as we have you, that is as much as we are provided for, and that is as much as we are kept in your love and in your goodness. I give you glory, Lord, because you are good. Thank you for protection, and thank you for assuring us that we have you, the Holy Spirit, in us forever and ever, and we can never lose you. So I pray for these saints that they keep in memory of these things, that they are protected, that they are loved, that they are satisfied, that they are justified, that they have you completely and you are for them forever. I give you glory and praise in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Come on, join your hands and give the Lord glory and honor because he's good in Jesus' name. Amen.